everybody. Over the last couple of years, I've developed a very good relationship with the people at Jaguar Land Rover, and they've kindly loaned me a number of different press cars, and I would say that I have enjoyed the majority of them. But then it is very easy to enjoy a car with a fire-breathing, rip-snorting, supercharged 5-litre V8, isn't it? As a petrol head, of course you're going to have a good time, especially when you've only got to deal with it for a week. So I figured for this time round, I'd ask for something completely different. A car which I previously had no interest in, and an engine configuration that really has me a little bit confused. So what are we talking about? This is a 2021 Range Rover Velar P400e, which is their plug-in hybrid. Yep, I wanted to see what these cars were actually like, particularly because the WLTP mileage figures for this car are something like 122 mpg, which clearly means the whole move to WLTP has done absolutely nothing because we clearly now can fudge the figures just as well as we did with the old EU driving cycle. So what's this about then? Well, it's the kind of mid-size Range Rover. It fits in between the uselessly small Evoque and the Range Rover Sport, which I actually also haven't driven. I have driven the full-size, full-fat Range Rover, but um, and I, and I, I loved, I loved that. That had the 4.4 liter V8 diesel, which is now no longer available. And this is, I would say, usefully bigger than an Evoque because you can get people in the back. But let's start outside. I kind of like the styling of it. I wasn't so keen on it when it came out, mostly because they launched it in, in just various shades of silver. But I'd say they've done a really good job of kind of blending sort of very traditional uh, Land Rover sort of or Range Rover silhouette. Yeah, you look at it, if you took all the badges off of it, you would instantly say that is a Range Rover. And that's something reasonably difficult to achieve in the modern world. There's some nice little touches like the little door handles that will disappear away when you do that and then reappear when you open, if, if it works. There you go. Oh, I think it's a, I think it's a double press, I think, and then properly secures the car, something like that. So, uh, nice big alloy wheels on it. Quite like the front grille treatment. Lights look good. It's all, all round. It's a, it's a decent looking car. Now, as you might imagine, this uh, model designation here, the P400e, this bit, the S is the trim. But this bit is your engine. Now, Audi, pay attention here, because this is all nice and easy to follow. So all of the, the different models in the, the JLR lineup, it's just the horsepower figure. So 400, 400 horsepower. So this should be a decent performing car. Now, as you might expect, you will find, let's have a look at that power plant, shall we? Oh, the thing's got bored. Do you like, by the way, this different style of doing the walk-arounds? Because I'm experimenting with it. I've done it once or twice before. For me, it's actually quite efficient. It gives a very different flavor to these kind of reviews. And I haven't had as much time with this as I would have liked. So it actually works quite well, because it's sort of me talking about the car, discovering some elements, some stuff I know already. Anyway, so down here you've got a two liter out, very warm, two liter turbocharged four cylinder. And then of course you have your hybrid gubbins. Now they do also do some mild hybrid uh, cars as well, but this is a, a plug-in hybrid, so you can charge it. That's just over 20 miles of electric range, but that's a, and that's a big problem. We're gonna get onto that in a moment. Now what I don't really know is the power figure of this engine on its own. I know that the total power output is about 400 horsepower. And I know that the electric motor makes about a, just over 100 kilowatts, which is about 130, 140 horsepower, something like that. So they do do a P250 of this engine. You can buy one of these um, uh, with that. That's kind of the base model. Uh, and then you can also get some diesels. You get, um, there's a V6 petrol as well, uh, which is mild hybrid. In other cars, say like the XE, you can get a P300 version of this. I reckon this has probably got 270 to 300 horsepower because when you have electric cars, you rarely ever just add the two power figures together to get your true output because that's not the way these motors work. So this is probably making a bit more power than it does normally. The price of this, by the way, your base Velar is about 45,000 pounds, which is surprisingly cheap, much cheaper than I thought it was going to be, considering the full fat Range Rover that I reviewed, okay, it was a Vogue, uh, was about 100,000 pounds, more or less on the nose. So this one's less than half the price to start off with. However, this particular car, officially speaking, as tested, is just shy of 70,000 quid. However, there is a problem because on the spec sheet that I have for this, normally I love going through specs and prices and everything, on the spec sheet for this car, it tells you it has a panoramic roof. Clearly it doesn't. So that's a problem. And <clears throat> when you open the door of this thing, you will see perhaps my biggest issue with this car. 
what's that? What the hell is that? What's it doing in a car? And this really concerns me because this is now the third, no, fourth car maybe, I have encountered with a very, very similar looking material in it. Um, this is basically just the remnants of an old geography teacher. Um, and even worse, this stuff is suede cloth. It just feels weird. And considering these are sort of a rough and ready family vehicle, you're gonna have kids and dogs and everything in here, this, all this material doesn't look like it's gonna be very easy to clean. Every single surface in here, even this stuff, which is kind of, I kind of like, but it's weird to touch. Um, everything in here feels like it's just a trap for dirt and debris and just cheese strings and everything. Um, also, just an FYI to all of the PR departments out there, if you start specking this material in cars, every cameraman on planet Earth is going to hate you. Um, this stuff is essentially a test for what we call moire patterning. So, um, I've got two cameras. The one, I'm, the one that I'm using now is a Panasonic GH5, and it's actually quite a good camera. I replaced it with a Panasonic S5, which is more money and supposed to be better, but in actual fact, is much worse. One of the reasons is that it doesn't have an anti-aliasing filter in it. As a result, it's very susceptible to moire patterning. What is that? Well, I'll show you now. See everything kind of jumping around, weird shapes appearing in all the material? That's moire patterning. You've probably seen it before because most cheap cameras can have an issue with this. And there are certain patterns that exist, or more accurately are created, that are designed to just highlight it. And that, that is one of them. Also, so this is actually an upgrade option. This is like a thousand pound premium textile option. And I encountered it first off in the Skoda Enyaq IV. I've then encountered it in the Maserati uh, Levante courtesy car, which I currently have from Meridian Modena. And now I've bumped into it here, and I think I might have encountered it somewhere else as well. If this is gonna be a trend, stop it right now. Just stop it. Just pack it in. No, 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 no. Nasty stuff, nasty stuff. Doesn't deserve to be in a car. Like the odd little bit of it, like here or whatever, fine, but like, no, 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 no. It's just, it's just, it's just terrible. And you notice too, as well, with the, with the Velar, Scratchy plastic, weird stuff here, dashboard, the same. If you're thinking of a Range Rover as a premium car, and I think most people do, that's not that's not all very good. Like same thing, it is all, all scratchy weird stuff. Like this, to me, the Velar, they should have added another five grand onto the base price and just made it all a little bit nicer. Case in point, let's show you this, this gear lever here. This material just feels like almost like neoprene. -y. I also spent ages being absolutely flummoxed by why they felt the need to just put a big glossy panel here that doesn't really seem to do anything. And then I, then I saw this and I thought, oh my love, they, they can't even fit a badge right. I mean, look at, look, at the, look at the different gaps on that. And then I went, oh, oh, right, okay. Now, as is the case with all modern cars, it is a festival of screens in here. And up front, you've of course you've got your regular digital display. I don't know which one wants to turn on first. And are you going to go beeping me? Are you going to go beeping me the entire time? You are going to go beeping me the entire time, aren't you? Because I've got the ignition on and the door open, you devil. So here you've got, um, so over here you've got sort of new uh, infotainment system. It works quite well, looks quite nice. I mean, it's, it's decent enough. In the Velar S, you have a Meridian sound system. The, the S doesn't really seem to get you a lot, to be honest. It's got like nicer wing mirrors, I think slightly better seats. Now these are heated and cooled. And I'll give uh, JLR some credit where it is due because you've got a second screen down here, which is very much part of the course. It's also covered in water spots. And that is how it was sent to me by JLR. So that tells you how tricky and difficult these things are to clean. But um, you have here some actual physical dials. Now, these look suspiciously like the ones that were in the Mustang Mach-E, so maybe they've sourced it from the same place, who knows? Maybe Ford and JLR are still working together. But I love this because it's nice and simple. You need a physical dial for that, so you can change your, your cabin temperature, like so. But also, if you push a button, it then alters your seat. So as the car's not on, I can't do it, but that would give you cooling and that would give you heating. You've then got volume control as a physical button as well. And then let's take a look at this menu because this, this menu hints at perhaps my biggest issue with this car. So you got all sorts of stuff here. You got massage seats. These, by the way, really good. Uh, you see heating options, your climate options, all, all the regular stuff. Uh, you've got many, many different response modes. The extra terrain response is an option uh, on this car. Um, I haven't really taken it off-roading. I'm not gonna go off-roading with it, just like nearly every single customer who's gonna actually buy one of these. But this is the bit I want you to pay attention to. You got three modes here. You've got hybrid, 
which is kind of the default mode and will use whatever it deems necessary. EV, where the car will use purely electric power and then save. And the idea of save is that it, it won't use any more electric power. But here's the problem. As you can probably tell right about now, I have zero battery left. I've got a full tank of fuel. I got zero battery because the way this car's been running, it has been just using as much electricity as it can and it hasn't been using really any fuel, which is, uh, I guess, not inherently uh, a, a, a problem. But, and, and, and here's the issue. In the Volvo V60 Polestar that I had not too long ago, which in theory is a very similarly kind of laid out car, um, you had a mode where you could get it to charge the battery and that had a similar setup, similar amount of power, similar split of, of uh, electric and combustion engine, and also similar range, about 20 miles. But the thing was, in the Volvo, you could press a button and have it charge the battery because one of the reasons you might actually want to buy a plug-in hybrid like this is if you do happen to have to go to places where you are not allowed to use a petrol or diesel engine. So you have to travel on purely EV power, which means what you want to do, and that's where the save button comes in, you know that you're going to have to you know, go into town and you've got to be running on pure electric. So you, you hit save and it, it saves. And with the Volvo, if you know you don't have enough electric power, you press the charge button and it will actively put electricity into the car. This does not have that function. If you hit the save button, all it will do is just stop using any more electricity. If it gains more electricity, so even if you were, like I was a minute ago, at 5% power, and you get a little bit more electricity by rolling down a hill or braking or whatever, the minute you then put your foot down, it'll just use that excess electricity to hold it at 5% which is really, really annoying, because that means very, very quickly you wind up with a car that has no electricity left in it, which is a problem because you've then lost essentially a third of your power. And it gets better. I didn't want to do this review with no charge in the car because that doesn't seem very fair, does it? So I took it to the only fast charging station in the town where I live. And first off, you had to work out where the charging port is. I thought, is it there? Well, no, that's actually where the where the petrol goes in. No, it's actually over here, which is not very convenient because that's not where anybody puts the charging port. Most places put it at the front of the car, which means when I tried to charge up, someone had parked in front of the charging uh, station. So I had to nearly sort of push them out of the way to be able to hook up. Then, and this is an Instavolt station, by the way, I tried three different cards to try and get the thing charged. And um, it declined all of them. So I thought, okay, it's not a problem. I'll phone Instavolt, tell them there's a problem. I phoned Instavolt and I said to them, oh, I've, I've just tried three different cars at your charging station here in this town and uh, none of them work. And the, and the lady said, oh yeah, no, we had a problem with connections to the stations. Um, so yeah, no, you have to wait about an hour or so, could be longer, um, and we're, we're just trying to fix them. It's a national issue. So every Instavolt is down, which is not helpful because the other uh, places nearby are also Instavolts and they're 15 to 20 miles away. So if I was in a regular electric car, I'd be pretty screwed. So I said to her, so um, I said, you can't, you know, you can't just override it and tell it to charge, uh, can you? Then she's like, nope, no, we can't do that. I said, so I'm, uh, so I'm stuffed then, aren't I? And, uh, and to give her her due, the most honest customer service person I think I've ever spoken to, she said, uh, yeah, you are. <laughs> so, um, so I, try, I tried to charge the car for the review, but, um, was not to be and this is part and parcel of the whole charging thing the uk government have just increased the vat on charging from five percent to twenty percent which means it's even more expensive than it ever has been to charge a car i could have charged it at home but i didn't really think i would have to not a lot of people have that ability and, and a car like this i would have thought it should have a way of charging itself that's that's kind of the point isn't it like with these things now the mild hybrids there is no way to plug them in that's that's the difference between a mild and a, and a plug-in kind of obvious but uh yeah, so that um, that wasn't very good. I don't really enjoyed that. So a few other things I guess we should talk about while we're doing the walk around. Rear seat space actually is not so bad. Uh, you even have reclining rear seats operated by the switch apparently from a Mondeo. That, that's old four window switches, isn't it? Someone tell me if I'm wrong, but they don't move a lot. And I think really it's more just to, to give you maybe a little bit of extra boot space than for rear passenger comfort, anything like that. It's not exactly a, an S-Class in the back here. That lovely panoramic sunroof up there, letting plenty of light in. And the boot is also a bit of a disappointment because here you will find 
some space, but not masses. Again, because the car's all stylish, you lose quite a bit of space. And then here you've got a similar amount of boot space to what I'd expect to find in a sort of decent sized hatchback. And when you then consider that this is a 70, thousand pound car as allegedly tested with the panoramic roof and the fruit machine in it um it's it's leaving me scratching my head just a little bit but there is of course more to this car than simply walking around in a car park what is it like to drive does it deliver the premium range rover driving experience let's find out Well, sort of. The first thing I can tell you about this car is that it is exceedingly comfortable. I mean, really quite impressive. I think it's actually better than the full fat Range Rover that I drove. In comparison, say, with the Volvo V60 Polestar that I had, it is, of course, a lot more plush. But, maybe unsurprisingly, when you try and push on a little bit, it's um, not quite as keen that I don't think really is going to shock anybody. However, I did try and enjoy myself a little bit with this car and um, it all unraveled rather quickly. Now, it's these kind of scenarios where this really falls down. You see, this is the sort of Range Rover that people who live in town may actually want to buy because it is quite a bit smaller than the big ones. In fact, I would say, as a thing to just drive about in, this is quite easy to place. It's even got some very trick little stuff, so it's got some special cameras and things that when you are driving about and you've got a 360 mode, you can even see, technically, under the car. Don't really know how they do that. It's rather magic and I'm very impressed by it. You can park this easily. It's about the right size for many of these roads, whereas the, the larger 4x4s can feel a touch on the daunting side. When you're trying to pull out at a junction, even when you do have some charge in the electric motor, it's not very good. People talk about electric cars as if they've got this instant torque, and the fact is, they don't always, all the time. Yeah, sure, there'll be points where you put your foot down and just you get instantly that whole four or five, 600 horsepower or now more. However, in some other vehicles, you put your foot down and not a lot really seems to happen for quite a bit. Now, when this car is then running in, in true sort of hybrid mode, it's particularly frustrating because the car realizes very, very quickly that electric motor isn't particularly adequate for trying to get this thing off the line. So then the petrol engine kicks in and it doesn't really do that in the smoothest of fashions. And then you get the performance you were asking for only about three seconds too late. And that might not sound like a lot of time, but trust me, when you're trying to pull out at a junction, that is a lifetime. Driving position is the typical Range Rover, which means it's very good. You can see basically everything, even without the fancy cameras. Rear visibility is good, plenty of glass at the back, so I can see pretty much everywhere. If somebody was driving one of these, they hit you and said they didn't see you coming, they were lying or they were stupid. I don't hate the digital display, although like many other JLR products, I don't think they've really made as much of it as they can. But it's bright, it's clear, very easy to read and gives me more or less the information that I need. Sadly, some of that information you may not like to hear because this car does have a claimed MPG figure of up to 122. Currently, this car has been averaging, granted over the last 11.7 miles, 21. Now, I do like the controls on the steering wheel. They look like they are the same touch-sensitive things that you'd find in the new VW range, which I hate, but actually they're not. And they do have little indentations and things on them to make you know where your fingers are, and it's all actually quite well thought through. But what you get is you press different buttons and different things light up to show you the different functions you've enabled. And actually, one thing I do want to, I do want to show to you while I'm here, listen to this. That's, a, that's the build quality of a £70,000 Range Rover. That's not good, is it, really? It's 
So what I was going to find for you was the trip information from a much, much longer time. So let's have a look at a trip summary. So let's get into here. Everything on here always just feels just like it's just, just, just that, that little, little bit delayed. Okay, so now we're going to look at trip A, which is from a, a, a much, much longer journey, including before I had the car. So that's 762 miles. Now, these are journalist miles, so they probably weren't the easiest, but I think this is then a very accurate figure. So 762 miles, the car has averaged 30 to the gallon. In other words, not far off the figures that I was getting from the 4.4 litre V8 diesel full fat Range Rover, which is bigger, heavier, and has a lot more toys. This means, as far as I'm concerned, that the whole plug-in hybrid thing is absolutely useless. The lack of a self-charging feature just renders this entirely redundant for me. You can't clearly rely on the charging networks because they are absolutely useless. Yes, you can technically charge at home and maybe for some people this will be the kind of thing that they want. Here's the thing though, for fairly similar money to what you'll pay for this plug-in hybrid four-cylinder, you could have either a diesel or petrol V6. The petrol will put out similar power figures to this. The diesel has a bit less, it's 300 horsepower, but obviously quite torquey. And that's probably the engine I take, and I think that'd suit this car quite well. It's actually a little bit cheaper too. If you want to save a lot of money, you could then just get this car entirely without the hybrid system. And were I driving this car now, and you told me it was a £50,000 Range Rover, I would actually be finding quite a bit of forgiveness for it. Because I go, yeah, you know what? Some of the materials, not quite up to scratch, all that jazz. That's okay, that's fine, because it's half the price of a real Range Rover. But this one isn't. And I think that's maybe the problem with this particular car, that it needs to go one way or the other, either be quite a bit cheaper, at which point you can find forgiveness, not for the rattle though, that's not being forgiven, um, or you make it just that little bit more expensive, make it a little bit more plush, make it feel like it's just simply a slightly scaled down Range Rover. But this to me, at 70 grand, well, I would just tell people, if you want a sporty, daily, drivable, you know, usable plug-in hybrid, go by the Volvo V60 Polestar engineered, incredible car, feels a lot nicer in here, it's rarer, much better to drive, you can press on in it way nicer. Okay, a little bit firmer, actually all right, a lot firmer, but it does have adjustable suspension, so you can probably dial some of that out. Yeah, okay, it's not gonna be quite as good off-road, but were you really gonna take your 70 grand Range Rover Vela off-road? I don't think you were. or you just go and get a full fat Range Rover that's just a, a couple of years old. Alternatively, you could go and get an F-Pace SVR. Again, you get a lightly used one of those for similar money to this. And there were things I prefer about this. I prefer the driving position. It's much easier to place this car versus the F-Pace, and, and they are sister cars, by the way, in case you weren't aware, they use the same platform. But the F-Pace just has that absolutely ludicrous, hilarious character about it. They've also just revised that, given it all new infotainment and everything, so it should hopefully be a little bit more reliable, because it is that which tends to let these cars down. This I haven't had for anywhere near long enough to be able to tell you if it's good or not, but the old system, I can tell you with authority, is criminally unreliable and a real Achilles heel of the entire JLR lineup. Wow, Merck just, just driving randomly over the white lines for no reason at all, as you do. Okay, on roads like this, the car does feel perhaps a, a little bit big, but that's okay, because you can place it easily, you can place it with accuracy. I'm not really worried about it, I'm not really concerned about it. In the same way that I was, say, the Bentley Bentayga I had. You put your foot down, and the really crazy thing is, I actually quite like this engine. The hybrid bit, I think, doesn't really add anything, because when you drive it with the hybrid dead, I don't feel like I've missed a lot. Yeah, sure, you get a little bit maybe extra punch, but it doesn't actually come in with anywhere near the quickness you want, so it's not really filling in for the turbo lag. You've still got that, you still experience that. And if you lose the hybrid system, probably shave quite a bit of weight off the car too, you know, make it a bit simpler. You may even get a little bit more boot space as well. And um, I just, I, I, I have no problems with this four cylinder. It's actually a nice engine. I, it's really good. I had the P300 in the Jaguar XE and I didn't feel like that sort of suited 
that type of car. But in here, actually, it, it's, it's fine. It doesn't feel like an inadequate power plant for this size of car. I was concerned that it might, but it doesn't at all. I'd still rather a V6, though, because why not? Ride comfort, excellent. Steering is decent. It's what you'd want in this kind of car. It's got a, a reasonable amount of weight to it. It's not full of feel or, or anything like that. Brakes do need a bit more of a shove than you might think to bring the car to a halt. Wee! And yeah, it's brisk enough. You put your foot down, it, it does the job, it does move you. The car does seem to keep finding a little bit of hybrid power. It does say it's now generating full hybrid power, even though it's got next to nothing left. So obviously, every now and again, it's just getting a little bit in there, but the thing is just stuck at 0%, and it's never going to improve. It's never going to charge itself up unless I charge it, and that is driving me absolutely balmy, as you can probably tell. As is the old geography teacher, and the bit of old diver's leg, the neoprene, whatever it is, they've used for this gear lever here quite inexplicably. This is this is horrible material to touch. Ugh. Everything being glossy doesn't help either. I mean, this car is just going to be constantly, constantly dirty. Why would you pay an extra thousand pounds to have this in here? Ugh. And please, please, if you do get one of these, do not try and chuck it around a bend like an F-Pace SVR. I tried. It didn't go well at all. But this car is actually a delight to potter around in. Like I, I don't, I don't actively hate it at all. And I think many of the things I have an issue with in this particular car are ones of spec rather than the model itself. So I think spec wisely, and you could get yourself either a fairly nice shrunken Range Rover or you get yourself a relative bargain off-roader. I would, however, suggest giving some serious consideration to the other cars in the Land Rover lineup because a good friend of mine has recently got himself a Discovery, and he really likes it the previous generation, but it's been a really good car to the extent that he has one and his brother has one too, because they're just so useful and just do absolutely everything. They've got more seats than this, got plenty of space, good lineup of engines, like it has a bit of everything. Oh, poor E46 has had its wing mirror smashed. Is it just me or have E46s like nearly disappeared off the road lately? Like, to the extent that I am now pretty much gonna consider all of them classics. I really love the E46. The Range Rover Velar is not actually as bad a car as I thought it might be. I don't think you really need to buy one, but then that applies to nearly everybody who buys any Range Rover. However, the PHEV bit of this, I really struggle to recommend. If you're desperate to spend 60 grand on one of those, just go and get the V60 Polestar. They're cool. Anyway, that's enough from me. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.